So good good day, good uh, morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are right now in planet Earth. Welcome to Moving to Planetary Health, The Next Frontier, What, How, Now. This is the second webinar of the Global Health Governance Building the Reset Campaign hosted by the Health Systems Governance Collaborative. I'm Renzo Guinto, a public health physician from the Philippines, leading a planetary health startup called PH Lab. PH stands for the Philippines Public Health and Planetary Health, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. I am utterly thrilled to be facilitating this very important and exciting transcontinental conversation. Before we proceed, let us hear from Benjamin Rufi from the Health Systems Governance Collaborative for some opening remarks. Benjamin? Thank you, Renzo, and thank you everybody for joining. We are super excited at the Collaborative to have this session today. I'm just gonna say a word about the Building the Reset campaign, and then I'll, I'll let Renzo introduce the participants and start up the discussion. So for those of you who have been following it, we've launched the campaign last month with an opening webinar uh, the whole idea behind it is to try to connect the different efforts that are being made across the globe uh, as we try to push forward a, a vision for health system that is much more holistic and inclusive. So the idea is really to start a conversation, to connect people and initiatives, and then to, uh, going forward, try to document those initiatives and try to connect the dots and try to actually produce uh, evidence on how this vision could be achieved. Um, for, for this, we have created seven work streams uh, trying to get push forward in this direction was some on, on common goods for health, some on multilateralism. And today we're super thrilled to be beginning this uh, series of webinar on those seven work streams by the, the webinar on planetary health, which is probably the, the best embodiment of a holistic and uh, inclusive approach. So I'm not going to take the floor much longer, Renzo. Thank you for allowing me to introduce and I look very much forward to hearing your uh, different uh, discussion points. Thank you very much. Thank you, Benjamin. So, so, so as you've heard, planetary health is one of the seven themes of the Building the Reset campaign. Fundamentally, planetary health is about the health of people and planet. It was conceived as a reaction to public health, which mainly concerns uh, about the health of people. Without any doubt, public health has dramatically improved the health and well-being of the global population, even adding around 30 years to the world's average life expectancy. But these gains are not without costs, especially to the environment. We all know that COVID-19 is happening against the backdrop of massive global environmental change, which then presents new health challenges in return. More than a new discipline, to me, planetary health is an integrated positive vision for the future of health of both the human civilization and the planet on which it depends. For the past several years, planetary health has energized, especially younger generations, including myself, who will inherit today's problems and lead tomorrow's governance. This is an exciting occasion because in this webinar, we are bringing together the planetary health community on one hand and the quote unquote health, traditional health systems community which is devoted to building strong and resilient health systems and achieving universal health coverage. Unfortunately, it is not often that environmental sustainability is part of the health system and global health equation. Today, our esteemed panel representing diverse disciplines, sectors, geographies, and generations will reflect on the transformative power of planetary health as a new compass for renovating health systems governance and improving health for both people and planet in the age of COVID-19 and beyond. Let me introduce our distinguished panelists. So first we have Dr. Jamila Mahmoud, who is the special advisor on public health to the prime minister of Malaysia. From 2016 to 2020, she served as undersecretary general for partnerships at the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, or IFRC. Previously, Dr. Mahmoud was the chief of the World Humanitarian Summit Secretariat at the United Nations in New York, founder and president of Mercy Malaysia, and member of the advisory group of the Central Emergency Response Fund, appointed by the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. 
Dr. David Abura is a founding director of Coastal Oceans Research and Development in the Indian Ocean, or CORDIO, East Africa, which is a knowledge organization supporting sustainability of coral reef and marine systems in the Western Indian Ocean. Dr. Abura works to integrate conservation and development through inclusive blue economy principles and links provided by global sustainability goals and targets. He is a member of the Earth Commission, which is part of the Global Commons Alliance, a new platform for the environment and the economy, aiming to transform the global economy so that society can prosper on a stable, resilient planet. Our third panelist is Dr. Tolula Oni, who is an urban epidemiologist and public health physician at the Medical Research Council Epidemiology Unit based in the University of Cambridge. She is also an honorary associate professor in public health at the University of Cape Town and leads the research initiative for cities, health, and equity. And her research focuses on transdisciplinary urban health, generating evidence to support healthy urban development and public policies in rapidly growing cities. She serves on several advisory boards, including Future Earth and the Lancet Planetary Health. And finally, we have Dr. Nicole Redverse, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine, Indians into Medicine program at the University of North Dakota's School of Medicine and Health Sciences. She was the first licensed practicing naturopathic doctor in North America, who is Dene, a member of the Deninukue First Nation Band, and is a senior fellow for Indigenous and Community Health with Invivo Planetary Health. She recently published the trade, back, uh, the trade paperback, uh, The Science of the Sacred, Bridging Global Indigenous Medicine Systems and Modern Scientific Principles. To our panel, welcome and thank you again for joining us. Before we start, I just want to make you aware of a couple of things. When you registered, you agreed to the session being recorded. The link will later be made available to those who are not able to attend. We will start with an initial round of five minute interventions from our panelists to be followed by an open discussion. And to our participants, you are invited to type in your questions or raise your hand by pressing one of the buttons on your screen. And I will either read your question or invite you to unmute your microphone. So now let's begin. And I would like to start with Dr. Abura. Given your expertise in global environmental change, and your ongoing work in the Earth Commission, what do you think are the major pressing challenges at the nexus of human and Earth health that confront us today? And what a governance reset to address these problems uh, looks like, it would look like. Um, so I would love to hear your thoughts on, on this question. Thank you, Dr. Abura. Uh, thank you, Renzo. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody out there. And it's a real pleasure to be here on the panel uh, talking to real a really global community. Um, so I'll start with this question. My background is in coral reefs, um, and I think it's really a primary example um, of, of a collapsing global ecosystem really um, disappearing uh, in front of our eyes. Um, and I think the, the reasons are many. And I'll come to the slide behind me uh, as, as, a, as a metaphor for that. Um, but the issue is that on a global scale, when we're talking about challenges at a planetary scale, is we often can't fully see the whole picture uh, and all its details in front of us, which seeds a lot of doubt. Um, of course, scientists work on different parts of a problem, and it always looks a little bit different from one place to another. But there is a global consistency, and trying to identify that coherence is a challenge. Um, and then the other side of the problem is that, of course, all of these problems happen at the local scale um, and that many solutions have to happen locally. So by nature, they are small and localized. And the challenge is really building them up and integrating them up to the larger scale to have you know, really large scale impact. In this case, at the, at the global scale, talking about planetary health. So I think that's, that's the real um, challenge. And now at a time when we're exceeding uh, so many planetary boundaries. And I think this concept is really getting out into the public domain very much so. And uh, the COVID crisis is really illustrating that in a very specific context um, of, of this particular virus. 
but we have one one challenge after another rearing their heads and that's what this cartoon alludes to it's that we're facing the covid crisis but if we really only try and address the a small detail of what we can do about that in this cartoon you can find the original you can read it it says that people are washing their hands and they'll be fine but there are a lot of other problems behind the covid crisis if we don't deal with the the root um, of the crisis problems and so that goes to you know the the recessions that many countries are going through now because of the lockdowns there's a climate change um, which is at also at the root of the COVID crisis and behind all of that there's a biodiversity collapse which in my community that's what we're working on particularly with coral reefs and many other natural systems and extends to many others so i think the Understanding the scale of these problems is really hard. And what that does is it means that the consensus and alignment that we need for collective action is very hard to get to. Society is very polarized, and that's between countries, within countries and politics, among social groups. And there's very little trust uh, as we face so many challenges all at the same time. And so building that trust is really hard. We have a lot of knowledge. We really just need to build the trust to, to be able to move forward with solutions. And so really understanding this concept of, of one planet, of planetary health, and that we're pushing at its boundaries is really important. We need to find these solutions. And a critical part of that, that I think we in the Earth Commission, we're really working on very strongly is not just identifying that safe space to live in uh, on, on a planet with 7 billion and, and more people, but it also has to be a just space. It has to be safe for everybody. And everybody needs uh, access, not just to to basic rights and basic um, uh, amenities, but also to, uh, to the allocation of, of all the benefits that we get. So I think uh, a big step in the right direction of the sustainable development goals, um, they really provide a, a grand theory of integration and sustainability. Um, but of course, they have to be, be written down and they're conceived in perhaps a, a bit of a shallow way in terms of being able to address the root causes and deal with interactions amongst the goals and all the different challenges that we face. So really trying to identify deepening this hypothesis of sustainability of the sustainable development goals is an important one. And in the Earth Commission, we're really working on trying to identify uh, how we bring the sciences together, so from planetary health sciences or planetary systems, so climate and geophysics to, to biodiversity and then to social and economic spheres, to identify what this safe and just space for human development is. And I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you, David, for that, uh, um, you know, landscape uh, analysis, you know, for presenting to us what, where, where, where we are right now. Uh, in this day and age when it comes to not just the health challenges faced by people, but the health problems faced by our very own home, uh, planet Earth, uh, biodiversity collapse, for instance, um, is something that maybe we in the health sector uh, are not yet fully appreciating in terms of how they ultimately lead to um, diverse health outcomes. Um, I want to go next to Dr. Mahmoud, Jamila Mahmoud. You've worked in global governance spaces at the UN, the humanitarian sector in the IFRC, and now you're actually advising the Prime Minister of Malaysia in its uh, domestic COVID uh, response, among others. How do you see the current policy and political landscape uh, at local and international levels, especially when it comes to the challenges that David mentioned to us a while ago? Is there even appetite for planetary health among leaders, politicians, and decision makers? And how can we make this the overall governance frame and to make sure planetary health is uh, on top of the leader's table? So uh, Dr. Jimmy Lamamwood, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Renzo. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, Renzo, my role currently is as the public health advisor to the Prime Minister and uh, beyond COVID, uh, it's really to look at how we uh, actually institute health reform in the country. Uh, on top of that, I'm also on the Economic Action Council, which is really looking at how do we uh, look at the economic impact of the pandemic and uh, the recovery as well. Now, in terms of uh, planetary health itself, I think that the name planetary health is fairly new. 
Um, the problem, uh, whether it's global or local, is that everything has been work, uh, running in silos. People are looking at you know, planet and um, preservation of wildlife, biodiversity, environmental issues, uh, very much separately uh, to health. And I think that with COVID-19, it offers us a tremendous opportunity to really you know, reset, as you, as you said uh, earlier. And I think that we do need to look at health from the perspective of the planet. And also the planet um, uh, itself, its health has a tremendous uh, impact on our lives. One of the things we have realized uh, with COVID-19 is that without health security, there cannot be any form of security, whether it is economic, social security, and the root of health insecurity is very much uh, in the way we have treated our planet. Um, you know, encroaching into uh, you know, environments, um, the uh, you know contact between man and 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 and, um, and wildlife, and so on and so forth. So um, at our local level in Malaysia, so so before I go to that, I think what's really required now is much more of these events, much more advocacy and awareness, and uh, you know, clear um, uh, you know understanding of the intersection between planet and health. And we can't exist as well as a planetary health community in our own silos. I think what we need to do is look at how does this fit into already existing mechanisms like the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, the Paris Agreement, and all other different uh, protocols and frameworks that look at risk so that it doesn't now create a completely different silo of you know, planetary health risk. In Malaysia, I must say that, uh, well, I must first of all give a caveat that I've lived outside the country for a long time, so only just returned uh, you know, in the midst of the COVID uh, pandemic. But um, what I do know is that that, that the concept of planetary health is still very, very new here. But that itself pro provides us a great opportunity to build. So um, what, what we are doing, uh, at least on the, on the health side, is looking at what does health reform mean in this country? And I think that's where you know, we can bring in that health is, a, is multiple systems and that um, you know, in our uh, attempt to have a health reform, all the different other uh, agencies and ministries have to come on board now to look at the planet effects as well. So that, that's number one. The second thing is that how do we build a much more connected and distributed network, right? Because this is going to be how we solve problems in the future. It's no longer going to be uh, agency driven. It really must be driven uh, by interconnectedness among uh, the groups and individuals and organizations that are passionate about this and therefore, you know, driving that agenda. So, one thing I would say is that Malaysia, as part of ASEAN region, you know, ASEAN is, you know, as everyone says, is the it's the supermarket of, of of disasters, right? You whatever you want, uh, you can find in this region, and a, a lot of the climate uh, risks that we are facing and the climate disasters also have serious health implications. How do we also, beyond Malaysia, look at the ASEAN and Asia-Pacific approach to this? Because there are many similarities at the regional level. So one of the things that you know, we are working on, and Renzo is involved in this as well, and Maria, who is probably on the line, is how do we build you know, uh, an alliance here within Asia-Pacific? How do we set up a system where we can actually become you know, the, the forerunners in thinking, convening, experimenting uh, on the areas of planetary health? So I think that it is still in its infantile stage here in Malaysia, but definitely you know, the opportunity to grow. Thank you, Jamila. And um, you mentioned a while ago, ASEAN, the Asia Pacific as the market of disasters. I remember there was a Lancet report back in uh, a few years ago, um, uh, describing ASEAN as a microcosm of global health. And I think uh, the same thing can be said of planetary health. It's, it's a planetary health hotspot, uh, natural disasters, um, climate change, sea level rise, uh, infectious diseases. And I always say maybe this pandemic that we're facing now, uh, it started in Wuhan, but maybe next time if Southeast Asia does not prepare well, 
it can come from uh, one of the jungles in tropical Southeast Asia, whether the Philippines, Indonesia, or, or Malaysia. So indeed, uh, the importance of Asia Pacific as well in this emerging planetary health space. Now I'll ask, uh, I'll, I'll move to the other continent, <laughs> uh, Africa, but I know Tolu, you're based now in, in, in the UK. You've worked on issues at the nexus of urbanization, food systems, health inequality in low and middle income countries, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. So my question is what barriers, challenges, as well as opportunities do you see in terms of realizing planetary health in countries and communities, especially in the global south? Um, Jamila mentioned about uh, planetary health being in its fetal stage, you know, nascent stage in, in Malaysia and Asia Pacific. I wonder what's the situation in, in Africa and the other countries that you work uh, in. Thanks, Tolu. Thanks, thanks, Renzo, for the introduction. Um, I have two illustrations I'm going to show to demonstrate three points. Um, Renzo, if you wouldn't mind um, um, sharing those. Um, to answer your uh, quick question, it's interesting. We actually had, um, we had a meeting in, in Addis late last year that convened, um, it was around the Gates meeting that convened a bunch of different um, stakeholders across different countries on the continent to start thinking about what does planetary health mean um, in, the, in the African context. Um, and what, what is interesting is the difference, I mean, clearly planetary health is, is, is an emergency, but there is something about what's happening now that I wonder how the conversation would, how different the conversation would be if we'd had that discussion post COVID. Um, Put that to a side for a moment. There's three key points I want to make. Um, the first is around urbanization. I, mean, I come from an urban background and, and the planetary health problem blindness. So, you know, we often frame the COVID pandemic as a health emergency, but I think it'd be more accurately framed as a planetary health emergency. Why? Because we know that the nature of urban growth and um, Africa is, is, the, is one of, if not the um, fastest um, urbanizing region of the world is associated with this disruption of, um, of ecological, the ecological balance and risks exposure to, to new pathogens and emergence of new diseases. Um, I like this triangle because this is from a very classic epi um, perspective when you think about the triad between a contagion environment and a, and a host. And I think I find it helpful to think of the contagion not just as a, as a pathogen, but also a pollutant, particularly in the environmental context. So, if we, if we use this lens, you can see that, okay, the interaction between the contagion and the environment influences the emergence and the exposure risk. Um, thinking about the host and environment, we know things like um, the uh, overcrowding and adequate shelter. We know the impact of the human activities on in urban environments influences biodiversity loss. I put in here connectivity because both in terms of communication and um, we see this in the COVID response, for example, like the, the transmission of, uh, of fake news, um, I think it's a really important aspect when we start thinking about galvanizing public for action, connectivity to accurate information is really vital. Um, vulnerability is another important um, component, which is an interaction between the contagion and the, and the host. And this is environmental in terms, natural environment in terms of air quality, food environment in terms of food security, addressing the, in the context of the triple burden of malnutrition, so under nutrition, over nutrition and micronutrient deficient, um, deficiency, and also in terms of access to healthcare. So when we start thinking about it this way, and then if you look at the arrows, it shows you, you know, how the environment interacts between the um, influences the interaction between the host and the contagion. I find this, I find this a helpful way of thinking about framing um, the COVID um, issues and, and really highlighting the challenge of, of planetary health and the need for a more integrated approach. I would say there's a couple of barriers related to this um, because this is a very far-sighted approach. One is that problem blindness, so there's a disconnect in time and space between exposure and outcome, and David, you alluded to, to this um, earlier. Um, so for diseases and ecological, ecological disruption with a long time arc, and I think this plays an important role in influencing our perception of risk. Um, and a cognitive bias that drives a no-do dissonance. 
I think that's something that we actually have to confront um, because that is a, a, that's where we are evolutionally. <laughs> so we do have to confront that, that dissonance. Um, the second, I think, is optimizing systems to create health. The second barrier is the siloed accountability and financing for health. So we have the healthcare sector that's held largely accountable for population health um, and environmental that's held accountable for, for that. But actually sectors that drive planetary health do not measure the, the impact on decisions and actions made in, in a coherent way. The second key point is around resilience because that keeps coming up. But my second point is resilience is not an end point um, because we need to be cognizant of the fact that um, the sustained emergencies that continue to plague the world um, are uh, like a lot of those shocks and stresses are actually driven by intentional choices um, from local to global. Sometimes resilience is posed as, some, uh, as a, something we don't have control over, but actually a lot of the shocks and stresses that we see are driven by the intentional choices. So when we think about building resilience, I think it's important that we don't simply think about adaptation to cope with um, these shocks and stresses as an endpoint, but instead having a strong focus on prevention, confronting those upstream choices and decisions that weaken resilience by driving the system towards um, disease and ecological disruption. So in that context, um, we see resilient systems for health, focusing on strengthening the ability of systems and all the actors working in those systems to create um, sustainable, sustained um, and inclusive uh, human and planetary health. The third and final point I want to make is that health does not trickle down from good intentions. Now, this sounds like a very obvious thing, but it's really important. Um, if you show the next slide, um, Renzo, please, slide. And this really just, this is a point to highlight the importance of integrated governance, um, um, recognizing that these risks are interdependent. Not only are they inter interdependent, but many of these systems are in direct conflict with each other. So this is essentially, um, uh, the, 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 the numbers are in, um, uh, in, in red, um, are, are the SDGs. And thanks Jamila for point mentioning the SDGs, because I think it's important that we, we're not developing a parallel system. We do have a framework for thinking about this. How do we actually start operationalizing what governance for planetary health mean, means for us in this context? And I um, developed this thinking about that spectrum from life supporting environments to life and thinking differently about proactive resilience um, and, and some of the cross cutting issues. Because we need to think about uh, a, a more significant reform for governance for health. Um, I, I, always call, I always talk about systems for health and not health systems, because we have to think differently about what comprises a health system. I think if we're thinking about planetary health, we need to be thinking more inclusively about systems for health and systems for health would be all of those um, life supporting environments. How do we, what do we think about when we think about planetary health infrastructure? So how do we incorporate physical and social infrastructure across systems for health to, to um, build and operationalize what planetary health infrastructure would look like? Who is accountable for equitable creation of planetary health in the long term beyond, in addition to, but, the, but not solely healthcare actors? So I think we need to grapple with these complex and evolving realities um, um, that increase the risk of emergence of new diseases, accelerate climate change, et cetera. And we need these systems-based approaches to start thinking more proactively at, at prevention. Um, we can't do that without, I think, clear global leadership and, and mandates. And I think that highlights the, the really important role that the WHO amongst others play. Um, the, recognizing that we need several sectors on board Risk sharing is an important one because we see a wrong pocket problem. You have people creating issues and um, that detrimental to planetary health completely separate from um, those that are bearing the, the costs of it. And so thinking differently about incorporating the impact of health and the environment into performance indicators across public and private sectors, um, alongside more integrated data and metrics that would enable this. So I'll end with this provocation. We all, we're not, we are not, we all now familiar with the term flattening the curve, because we're all epidemiologists now. <laughs> we think about flattening the curve and concepts of COVID. My, content, my provocation is this. We need to think and shift our mindsets from flattening the disease curve to lowering the baseline need for health care. 
So we need to, uh, this needs to be accompanied by measures of health spend that reflect systems that are largely responsible for preventable ill health and, and planetary um, aid balance. And, and those that can and should play a meaningful role in the creation of planetary health, we need to be doing that. And, and that is the kind of rethink I think it's vital for um, to really start to get at that integrated governance for human and planetary health, confronting those social, environmental and commercial determinants. I've spoken for far too long. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tolu, for those, you know, provocative ideas and very important uh, uh, points and, and too many to mention. We'll review them shortly uh, during the open uh, discussion. But um, I was uh, triggered when you said about, you know, time to go beyond flattening the curve of COVID. And I've been seeing in social media, there's also another uh, caricature that shows that we also need to flatten the curve of our emissions, our carbon emissions, the curve of our ecological footprint. And unlike healthcare's capacity, which can be moved, remember that horizontal line in that diagram, that you can enhance by adding ICU beds or recruiting more health professionals. Unfortunately, the Earth's capacity is unchangeable and in fact, non-negotiable. And so there's only one way to address this these challenges, and that is for us to adjust and to bend uh, our curve. And I really like also what you were saying, we need to lower the baseline need for healthcare. And that is actually a, uh, you know, uh, in a way we're saying we, we should find ways to, to, for, for lessening our need for doctors like me. <laughs> like me, I'm putting myself out of business. <laughs> but uh, I think that's an important thing to aim for. <laughs> Have within the medical community as we try to bring planetary health uh, even to on to the top of health the healthcare table. Uh, mm -hmm. Now we will move to uh, Nicole, and uh, I know it's early in the morning in North Dakota, and so mm -hmm. we're very you, you, we feel very privileged that you're here with us. You know, you've been a staunch voice not just about the health issues faced by indigenous communities but also the importance of having their voice meaningfully heard in the broader health and societal discourse. What can we learn from indigenous communities and other unheard voices in shaping future health system governance that is oriented towards planetary health? So uh, Nicole, take it away, thank you. Thank you, Renzo. It's definitely uh, bright and early here, but it's a beautiful sun here in uh, North Dakota. And I'm uh, happy to be with you all uh, discussing on this important topic. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is that if we look at Indigenous nations uh, around the world, you know, many of our Indigenous nations don't have this concept or word terminology like the English word in planetary health. And the reason for this is that um, historically and even now within our societies, um, there is actually no separation between planetary health and, and our own health. They're completely intertwined and interconnected. So I really liked when Dr. Mahmoud said, um, you know, one of the solutions is these interconnected networks, which is basically framed on the indigenous concepts of interconnection, where there is no separation between self and planet. It's just innate within the societal views, the societal laws, uh, and operations and protocols that we find ourselves in. So the English term planetary health is really sort of a denoted modern turn in the essence where now we have to re-recognize or revitalize this idea of this planet as being this um, important component to our health and to our home. When for us, it really is one extension of ourself in and of itself. So, you know, those concepts of, of uh, uh, true natural laws, and uh, an elder told me last week, uh, Ganau is, is the term in, in um, uh, one of the northern Dene languages, which is natural laws. And if we think about health governance uh, being embedded within this um, epistemology of knowledge systems, we can think of two terms that you know, are important to the indigenous concept being decolonization and self-determination. And um, there's a Lakota colleague of mine, Dr. Donald Warren, who just says it brilliantly when he says, you know, 
sometimes these terms can be triggering. You know, we're not trying to bring up negative energy, uh, but it's so important to be able to um, walk through truth to be able to get to health equity. We really need to face some of these difficult conversations because if we think about colonization, at least from the Indigenous perspective, it really brought forth this consumptogenic pattern of living that's really antithetical to the realities of planetary health living. It's a fully embedded within the societal ways of need. Um, and, you know, these consumption patterns really bridged with these modern uh, neoliberal economic policies that really result in an ungrounding, um, literally and figuratively, ungrounding to Mother Earth and how we actually live our lives. So this, you know, healthcare system that we find ourselves in is directly embedded within this mind frame, within this epistemology, within this theory of knowledge. Um, and, uh, you know, I always state that um, if we have a theory of knowledge that brought us into this problem that we have today, this global, uh, you know, problem of environmental change, we cannot use that same theory of knowledge to get ourselves out of it. We have to switch our theory of knowledge to one that is bred and brewed within that interconnected network between oneself and planet. And by doing that, by looking at, at healthcare through this interconnected governance matrix, it really you know, brings together the systems-based thinking of how we merge concepts around global environmental change for what we know as healthcare today. Um, so you know, I really wanted to mention that because I think it just highlights some of the terms that we go through, but it also asks hard questions. Because if we as society are getting further and further away from nature, you know, we have many uh, people that are, are not believing in some of the climate change um, uh, impacts, uh, the narratives that are coming out, uh, you know, Dr. Woody mentioned about the, the media. Um, but for us as Indigenous people, and I've talked to many elders, the reason for this, the reason why we're seeing these dialogues and these narratives is that we have brought up our kids in buildings, we've brought up our kids in boxed structures, in squares, as opposed to circles and around in nature. They've lost that connection throughout the last decades um, with Mother Earth. And by doing that, we've automatically created that separation, that disconnect between what it is that makes us well. Um, and what makes us well is being on land, being in place, belonging to a place as opposed to a place belonging to people, which is sort of the view that we've, we've come on to um, as we've created further disconnect with there. So I do believe that health uh, governance um, should be based on these automatic natural laws. We need to think uh, um, more um, larger when it comes to how we platform governance, looking to Indigenous knowledges, Indigenous traditional knowledges, not as a systems of governments, but as a life uh, planetary governance system, which is innately existent in, in many of our traditional societies today. Um, and we have a lot of uh, knowledge embedded in there um, and realities that can be brought forth to the modern context. And how do we bridge those knowledge bases to be able to create solutions going forward? And I really am excited and hopeful to see continued dialogue around this area where we can start bridging these knowledge theories and really ask some difficult and hard questions about what is our reality today and how did that come about and what do we need to do to be able to change that? Merci, Cho. Thank you very much, Nicole, for those powerful insights and and indeed you mentioned about you know the links uh, between the current you know you said consumptogenic patterns of living that we have and even our modern day healthcare systems are uh, uh, totally uh, detached you know from um, you know this this um, uh, you know, appreciation of our being you know one with nature and and I remember there was a diagram uh, talking about you know the need to shift from being to, uh, a shift from an ecological approach where it's all about us and we're on, you know at the top of the hierarchy and move towards ecological approach and and that means multi species consciousness uh, i love that you said uh, we you know the land and you know the atmosphere are just extensions of ourselves and and i think uh, these are um, definitely important uh, you know, frameworks. I hesitate to use to say that they're new frameworks. They're actually ancient wisdom uh, that has been existing for millennia. Unfortunately, 
it's us who actually veered away from these, uh, as you described them, natural automatic laws, right? That, uh, and we've created our own laws that are now generating these new ecological problems that then affect our health in return. And so a lot of very important points there, uh, hopefully to inform uh, future planetary health governance at all levels. And, and maybe, you know, when people hear planetary health governance, they're thinking only about how to reform the WHO, which is a hot topic these days. How can we uh, make WHO a planetary health organization? But planetary health governance runs across all levels, you know, from local to global, and definitely, um, um, you know, the work of Tolu with cities, your work with indigenous communities, Jamila's uh, advisory role uh, to governments, and, and David's uh, work in, in making sure our coral reefs are, uh, are, are, are remain and, and be sustained uh, for generations to come. All of your contributions to planetary health are so important now more than ever before. So now I will proceed to questions and I invite all our panelists to um, write their questions uh, in the chat box or even uh, flag to me if you wanna speak. Uh, you can um, press the button that says raise your hand and um, I would like to, uh, you know, read some of these questions. I also have my other questions. Uh, there's one about, um, about the SDGs, actually. Um, uh, David uh, talked about the SDGs being a, 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 uh, a framework that already exists. Jamila also echoed the importance of working with existing frameworks, Tolu. Uh, included the SDGs um, in her diagram. Uh, I remember Richard Horton, the editor-in-chief of The Lancet, described the SDGs as the language of planetary health. But I think coming from where, you know, uh, you know, going to where Nicole is coming from, is the SDGs really the appropriate and sufficient blueprint for a better planetary health future? As we see, it's only you know, 17 goals, 169 targets, a lot of targets, and we have 10 years remaining to achieve them. So, you know, is it really the blueprint for a better planetary health future? And um, how can we use the SDGs as uh, a platform uh, towards uh, healthier people and healthier planet in the age of COVID and beyond? Anyone who would like to uh, start uh, answering that? Not a uh, very easy question. <laughs> I'm seeing David waving. David, <laughs> you can start. Okay, okay. well, I, I don't mind starting on that because I was, I was really happy to, to hear the SDGs or all, all the panelists mention uh, the SDGs, either specifically or um, what I believe they intend in, in, what, in what they were talking about. And I think there's a few important things to acknowledge about the SDGs. I think one is that um, so all governments, I mean, pretty much all governments on the planet have adopted the SDGs or Agenda 2030 and have said, this is our blueprint for development until 2030. So it's a political language that is there for us in the, in the, you know, in the technical sectors to use because it does have political buy-in. And it's, you know, it's very hard as has come up in, in a couple of statements already to try and address problems that are not front and center on the political agenda. So the SDGs offer us that. It's necessarily, they have to be simple as political statements. I mean, 17 goals, that's already a lot, you know, to really, to really deal with effectively in 169 targets. And, and those are, and they're defined through more administrative and bureaucratic processes rather than technical processes. So I think it's what they offer us is the, um, in the different sectors is an opportunity to frame the things that we feel we need to do uh, or that need to happen to uh, achieve them in, a, in politically relevant language uh, that, that countries have taken on board. And of course, it needs a lot more depth in many cases. The second thing is that many of the SDGs are conflicting with one another. So if you try and achieve just one, like to feed, uh, feed all people, you might, you might induce a lot of uh, environmental damage if you do it in certain ways. So you need to work out those interactions. I think one critical thing, I mean, uh, there's a lot I could say, but I, I don't want to, to um, take the mic for too long. 
But I think it came up in, in Dr. Redver's talk very strongly is that I think we do need to fully recognize that, and this is, I've been involved in the IPVEST process uh, the last few years, so the Intergovernmental Pol Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, that there are many different ways, different cultures have very different perceptions of nature and our relationship to it and have very different value systems. And the SDGs are written in a very uh, sort of, you know, the, the current language in, in global politics. And it doesn't necessarily speak to the, to the, what's really important to communities on the ground and to different cultures. And we really need to go a very long distance for the SDGs to be fully inclusive and to take on the, the aspirations and the values of very differing cultures around the world to, to protect what they see as important in their assets, but also maintain the planetary assets and everybody's assets at the same time. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, David. Anyone else who would like to jump into the conversation about the SDGs? Tolu, please. Yeah, I'll just, thanks David for that um, uh, kickoff. Uh, I'll just pick up on, on, on the word that you, that you mentioned, uh, which was values, because it speaks to something that I was, I cut out um, because I realized I was going to be speaking for too long but it's such a vital part um, of, of, the, of confronting the complexity. Um, because I really like that you mentioned the conflicting systems, because we often, we often choose to have that na naive um, veneer of um, superficiality um, by, by just assuming, and that's why I said health does not trickle down from good, good intentions. And the reason why is because the, 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 the systems are so interdependent and so interlinked and, and, don't, and not pointing in the, in the same direction. And so if we don't, you know, each little bit feels like something that, that, uh, that is the right thing to do and planetary help will magically follow, but that isn't true. Um, and, 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 and we really do know that. Um, the second thing to highlight was, um, which picks up on Nicole's point was, um, how much disservice we do uh, globally by not, by excluding and limiting um, the knowledge geographies that we, um, that we uh, adopt or that we bring into this conversation, into, into, into planning. If we're talking about a whole planet, uh, if we look at who is, who is participating and who is bringing different perspectives, None of what we're saying is new, and I think Nicole, you you <laughs> you have that point very strongly. Why do we why do we keep coming back to it? Is it is there something about the architecture of how we are seeking to address a planetary problem by not actually engaging the planet um, just because we have lots of voices? And I think that's something we can be um, we can be very critical about. And the last point was really on on values. Um, we talk about, so from an epidemiological perspective, we talk about um, understanding how um, uh, measuring the health, the impact of certain actions, associations, etc. What we don't talk about a lot, um, what we talk about a lot less is value modeling. And this is actually, this is not, there's nothing new about this, but it takes prior um, consideration of what we actually trying to achieve. And, and factors that into the, uh, the modeling of, of any interventions we build. Because I fear sometimes we, we try to achieve consensus on paper and we end up with something, but actually we haven't, our values are not aligned. And I don't, I'm not naive to, enough to think that, uh, you know, somehow we'll get the whole world agreeing on, on certain things, on, on everything. But I think if we, if we can learn anything from COVID is that there's some things that we can actually converge around. <laughs> and there's some things that we can say, okay, we don't agree on all of this, but actually this actual emergency, you know, we see what happens when people say that's not an emergency and what happens. So we, we can actually convene around and what are those values and how do we actually say, we have these divergent views, but actually these are the core sets that we want to develop um, our, our systems around and that we want, we can actually model those and incorporate those, in, those into, into, the, into the numbers. Otherwise, we, we separate these things and they don't, they don't meet up. Arendra, can I, 
Can Please, I add my voice? Yeah. Sure. I sure, think please. that, you know, uh, it, 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 these are such excellent points. But I think one thing, uh, you know, I'm a pragmatic human being, right? If you want to move the needle on planetary health, it does require political and economical, you know, um, ownership. I mean, not so much ownership, but will, right? So, for example, if you talk about, you know, the context and, uh, and the nuances of planetary health based on different country contexts, different cultures, uh, different value systems, and so forth. But with COVID, it has woken everybody up and shaken them. Why? Because of the, of the economic impact, uh, particularly, because now governments are all going to go into you know, deep recession and so forth. So I think that using the SDGs as a foundation that has been already well established, how did the governments and the private sector come on board with SDGs? You need to have a very similar approach. So you need to also look at, um, you know, how do you, do you also look at localization, right? We always look at these things in big picture, uh, you know, and usually, you know, driven by a lot of Western concepts. How do you now take this uh, apart and that governance can be as local as possible and as, as national as possible and as international as possible, only then you will get that buy-in. Now, in the, in, the, in the financial sector, how do you change that dialogue, uh, particularly when countries want to recover very quickly, to have that dialogue around the importance of environment, sustainability, good governance, the whole ESG principles, uh, in finance and build that narrative around planetary health as well. So I think that you know we we have to learn how to to contextualize. We also need to learn how to influence and how to fit in. Thanks, Jamila. Uh, so values, but also there's a need for an economic case, and COVID nineteen is uh, perhaps a, a you know a, the, the moment uh, to clearly articulate that, especially that. We know COVID is probably going to lead to reversals in progress uh, towards uh, achieving the SDGs. Um, so, if we do, Nicole, do you have uh, do you want to jump into the SDGs uh, conversation as well? Yeah, I think it's uh, you know it's a it's a, not an easy conversation when it comes to the complexities that exist. And if we think about you know, a small village in, in the middle of Africa or India or even here, I mean, the SDGs are not front in mind. So how do we knowledge translate some of these intricacies? It's early morning here, I can't speak yet apparently, <laughs> that, that exist at this local parameter level where this, you know, idea and worldview permeates based on needs of survival um, in a very different way. Uh, sort of all the way up the nested scales towards this larger governmental level, you know, it's, we haven't done a very good job of translating those differences and those intricacies between those nested levels. And I think having a, a process of knowledge translation existing, where we do see large government impacts actually being um, discussed and operationalized on these local scales would be very interesting to see how, you know, those smaller networks and nodes actually operate within, uh, you know, a very tiny space, because that will give clues on how to be able to bridge that to a larger arena. And I think about that a lot, you know, when I'm in a small, I'm from Northern Canada, subarctic area, very small, we're very remote, um, we're feeling the effects of climate change, you know, we're speeding up the warming uh, faster than anybody else on the planet it right now and I think you know SDGs you know, how does that relate to my elders life sitting on that you know log in her in her backyard and you know being able to bridge those gaps it's the bridging process you know bridging is the word for me when I think about um, how do we be able to bring these policies so I can sit down with her and say look this is what's being done on a global scale do you think this is right and how do you conceptualize this? And those conversations end up being very interesting. And I think, you know, it would be interesting to see more of those happening, um, you know, on a greater scale uh, around the globe. Thanks, Nicole. I think Tolu just has a, a short point uh, to just cap the entire SDG conversation. <laughs> short being the operative word. <laughs> and there's, 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 there's one word that we've been alluding to, but I haven't spelled out, which is timeline. Um, and I think the critical difference, um, Jamila, your point is completely well taken. The critical difference between COVID and the planetary health is timeline. Even in the economic, it doesn't make any long-term economic sense. 
health, um, human health sense, planetary health sense, and what we're doing at the moment. But in the short term, it's okay. Whereas in the short term for COVID, it doesn't make, um, you know, you focus on, well, we are going into a big recession, we have to do something about that now. So it really is just highlighting the importance of the, the financial drivers of, and the financial and political drivers of addressing longer time arc problems. Because unless those systems are optimized for long term, we keep, you know, long term is not a, is not a summative, um, it's not, a, it's not the sum of today and tomorrow. We actually have to have a different approach um, to, to address long term. And, and the, I think the critical challenge is there's always, there's always need today. And so we can't, and this is why in, med in medical perspective, prevention almost never happens. So we'll just deal with today's problems and then tomorrow we'll deal with prevention. Well, that never happens. So how do we actually reframe our thinking to think, Yes, there will always be emergent and urgent problems today and tomorrow, but we will continue to chase those and from a planetary perspective, run out of rope if we don't completely steer the ship towards a, a long-term approach, which is not, by the way, um, um, in conflict with, um, not always in conflict with the short term. It just requires a different mindset. Thank you, Tolu. Sure, David. Actually, yeah. that, that, that the issue around the temporal dimension, there's a question here about investing in planetary health. The, 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 the effects, the benefits may only accrue on, on a long-term basis. And so how do we convince elected officials, for instance, to invest in the long term while addressing the immediate such as COVID-19? David, you want to, you have additional points. Yes, okay. I, I can't come back to that one, but I had wanted to just get to a point that the Critical question that Nicole asked actually about how do you convince uh, you know your grandmother sitting on a on a log somewhere in a in a rural area about what the SDGs are about, and this is something that I I have really sort of put put my mind to because I think it's critical, um, and I think it's um, in the chat I posted I have written an article about it and the idea is about it's it's narratives I mean we think of the SDGs and amongst us we have said a theory of change that basically is an explanation for how things work. And we can build narratives about our lives. And the SDGs are about our lives and how, what we eat, how healthy we are, our education, our rights and equality, uh, you know, the environment that we live in. And I think in any context, you could probably get somebody or yourselves express a narrative that touches on all 17 of the SDGs in about 150 or 200 words, but in plain language. And I think realizing that and then building up the narrative for change from those local stories rather than bringing it down from the top of the formal SDGs would be a way to go. And I think, you know, building those stories, and that's what really um, resonates in many parts of the world and different cultures is to really build that story of what sustainability is about. And this comes to the temporal dimension. And because all of the, all of the SDGs really rely on primary assets, you know, we, we, we get benefits from the environment. We can, we can catch fish because there are fish in the sea, you're fish in a lake, and you take a certain amount off to eat, but you need to leave a certain amount in uh, the sea uh, to reproduce for the for next year's catch. And so we have to protect all of those assets. And all of them, whether it's education, social welfare, uh, governance, those are all assets that we need to build up to, in order to gain benefits uh, in the long term. So unless we take a long-term perspective, unless you really look at how all these different things interact. So in responding to COVID, you don't just do a single sector response that might undermine something else. You have to look at all those other things as well. And I think in disaster relief now from natural disasters, that's becoming very much front and center is where you, you really don't just focus on just housing people or feeding people or getting people jobs again as quickly as possible, which you really need to do, but you think about how does the interventions you do, how do they build on natural assets? How do you make sure that you don't undermine natural assets that then make people more vulnerable five or 10 or 15 years down the line? So I think it's really getting to that understanding. And I think it's stories about sustainability. These narratives are what are understandable to people. And you can put the SDG brackets or parentheses on afterwards, a bit like uh, Tulula's figure that had the SDGs in red in brackets, almost as an afterthought. You could develop that whole framework just from first principles in your field and then if you've done it well you'll see that you've probably addressed all the different components yeah 
just to mention, David, that's exactly what I did actually. And you you would notice this. I went afterwards and tried to map out whether yeah. I, the, that was an initial plan. And there were two things that weren't covered in the SDG. One is migration, and the other is healthcare seeking. So those were the only two components that weren't covered by an SDG. Yeah. Great, great. And so uh, it seems there are a lot of points when it comes to narrative creation and, and really telling a new story um, you know, about the future, whether we use the SDGs as a starting point or the economic case that Jamila was referring to, or even the ethical imperative that we uh, are being um, uh, reminded about um, uh, at this moment. Uh, you know, we have lots of questions and, and we have around, you know, 15 minutes remaining and we'll try to, you know, I'm trying to even bring together some of the related questions. There, there are a lot of questions with, uh, with regards to, um, you know, and maybe this is more from an academic uh, discourse. Uh, you know, there's, there's planetary health, there's one health, there's eco health, there's, you know, population health and environment, there's geo health, there's so many healths, right? So many terms uh, that seem to be very interrelated, uh, you know, and, and I'm sure, you know, our, our friends from the audience can find an article that tries to distinguish between these different terms and how these different terminologies have evolved. I think the question that we would want to answer is how do we bring all these communities together? Uh, the veterinarians who invented One Health, the public health professionals who are now rebelling and uh, proposing a new planetary health agenda. And maybe, Nicole, you have some ideas given that you've, you've, been, you've been in these spaces, right, uh, as an academic um, and, and uh, an advocate. There's actually a, a great paper um, senior authored by Margot Parks that actually describes all the different um, planetary health, eco health, all of these different um, dimensions, which I think is fascinating. And, you know, I've been popping into little circles here and there and just, you know, joining the, the conversations just to see the difference, because I was curious just to see, you know, coming from this indigenous worldview, how are these different um, disciplines, so to speak, that are developing, defining, um, you know, how they interact with the world, uh, their values, uh, what they're driven by. And, you know, there's, there's overlap for sure between all of them, but they also have something a little bit unique about each of the different fields too as well, which I, you know, I find interesting. But what, what you know, sort of gives me pause is the fact that there isn't a lot of interaction between these disciplines. So that was one of the reasons why I started popping them in to say, hey, you know, why aren't we talking? Why aren't we communicating? Why aren't we bridging these ideas together? Because there's some fabulous ones. I mean, the eco health movement, they have a lot of principles based on knowledge translation and gender equity and some of these big features that we don't see a lot being emphasized within planetary health. And then obviously the animal systems where in indigenous knowledges, again, we're all equal in that aspect. So why are the animals over here and the plants over here? You know, those are all the same for us. So I would really like to see some uh, networking, you know, that interconnected node that uh, Dr. Dr. Mahood was talking about, how do we break down those silos? Because we really are talking about, in essence, the same thing. We're just using different languages and principles to be able to do it. Um, the other thing I want to flag, uh, which I think is an important example, and even though it hasn't been operationalized to the full extent, um, Bolivia in 2012 passed the law of Mother Earth. Um, and I think it's a great example how uh, a government uh, you can, can be mobilized to actually enact and pass a law uh, to be able to ensure that mother rights are protected. Now, obviously, we know that hasn't been operationalized to the extent that we hoped. However, I think, you know, it might be an interesting um, um, thing to look at to see what were the challenges that were involved with that. You know, what were the barriers? Start to explore some of that in Bolivia um, because, you know, there's no other examples really at the federal level where they have been able to do that. Um, so I just wanted to mention that too because I think it's an interesting thought point about how these concepts of planetary health may actually be uh, able to be embedded in a, in a legal form. Thanks, Nicole. And actually, there's one question about the role of courts. You know, can we actually sue uh, governments and hold them to account if they pollute the air, uh, not just for uh, ourselves, but also for generations to come. Uh, and I think there's so much to learn, for example, from Bolivia, you mentioned 
I remember in the Philippines there was a, a, a case, you know, in case law where children were able to, uh, to, and even the unborn were able to sue uh, the Philippine government uh, for, again, neglecting uh, water resources in the country. And I think there's some examples recently of children and young people in the U.S., I think in the Netherlands, again, uh, holding uh, to account their governments and using uh, the legal structures uh, that we already have. And again, another terrain that you know, will require probably another uh, full, full length webinar. Um, sure. So um, I think there are a lot of questions with regards to uh, you know, uh, practicality, right? And, and I think Jamila was also, you know, she, she mentioned a while ago, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm coming from a more practical standpoint, having worked with, with governments and, and UN agencies. But I guess, um, you know, and I think uh, now is the time to talk about, you know, what is the next? Uh, what, what's our homework, basically, in trying to infuse the world with planetary healthness, uh, making sure that it is really the overarching frame and our new compass uh, for future governance um, in this age of COVID and beyond. Uh, any thoughts? <clears throat> <laughs> um, Jamila is speaking please, yeah. please thank you I think you know I, we need to build greater awareness and I really love you know I think uh, the previous speaker talking about you know how do you, how do you build in the storytelling element right of this but I think we also need to 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 build the narrative by making younger people really you know passionate about this because at the end of the day you know it will be um the voters that will actually push a lot put a lot of pressure on governments on what policies they want to you know take forward and so on and so forth and I, again i repeat that covid has really been a wake-up call to to a lot of people but i think pragmatically uh, how do we build a network uh, that i mentioned earlier the interconnectedness and demonstrate, even if it is uh, small case studies and really, you know, what impact it has had in countries or situations where, you know, there has been a concerted effort to look at health from a much broader perspective. And the other thing is, as, as well, is that how do you actually influence medical schools, right? The educational uh, aspect because uh, as someone who you and my uh, Renzo probably went uh, no I went through medical school but you know it, medical uh, education is so clinical uh, and and how do you change that uh, to one that really um, you know uh, allows students to experience working in certain environmental contexts, for example, rather than doing a, an elective on surgery, but actually doing an elective on reef conversation, uh, conservation and, and the impact of that on health. So I think how do you make it real for people, right? So I, I think that it will take time, but I have, you know, I'm fairly optimistic that the sense of urgency that everyone is experiencing now may give us that opportunity to actually accelerate it. Um, and to remind, uh, you know, those who are looking at economic policies that it's not just about rapid recovery from COVID, but the longer game plan. Um, and, and also, uh, how do we make, uh, you know, show the long-term benefits uh, of actually investing in planetary health. So I think, you know, it's not going to be easy, but I think, you know, we have to uh, uh, do that. And someone, Mr. Lim or Ms. Lim said that uh, uh, not just medical school, but also schools offering health. Yes, absolutely right. I'm not just saying medical school. I mean, I went through medical school and this was completely not on the syllabus, right? But how do you make life sciences also talk about planet and planet health? Great, great. Anyone else? Uh, David, are we ready to bring physicians and nurses and other health professionals to coastal communities to see firsthand how our coral reefs are being uh, endangered by, uh, you know, global warming and ocean acidification? Yes, I mean, we'd, we'd love to do that, to, to show people what's really happening. But, you know, 
I don't think you have to go that far to really show people what's happening in terms of, of climate change and, and changing patterns in nature around them. I think it's, it's now impacting or affecting people all around the world in seasons and in, in what you can observe around you. So I think really linking um, these things together to get people to really understand. And I think the, the core thing is getting an appreciation that, you know, until now we've been few people on a large planet. And so, you know, there's this issue of externalities for businesses and economies. You know, if you pollute the waters, that's an externality because it doesn't cost you to, to clean it up. But it was always just going to impact somebody else downstream and you wouldn't hear about it. There was no connection or it wasn't that much. But now there's, there's no more space left anymore on the planet, really. The, 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 the essence of this planetary health or planetary dot, dot, dot um, terminology is that we are affecting things on a planetary scale. So we have to uh, internalize all these externalities. So whether it's the health sector or environment or food production or, or other things, we really have to see that we, we must internalize all those costs so that we don't impact on other parts of the planetary system that support our lives and support our livelihoods. Thank you, David. Uh, anyone else? Tolu? Please unmute yourself. <laughs> Got too much things open. <laughs> okay. Um, four quick points. <laughs> The first is imagination. And I am sorry to, I know this is practical, but I think it is, um, I think one of the greatest threats to a positive reset post COVID is, is, is addressing that stagnant mindset of impossibility. And I think one of the key things that one of the key learnings that we can get from the, re from the responses to COVID is it's just really just to revisit our limits, our perceived limits of what is possible. Uh, that is that is a point to be made in the practical sense of the word um, because we experience it and we think we learn but if we don't pause and acknowledge it to say there are a lot of impossibles are happening now so when next after we cover when we start talking about all the different things that are impossible let's remember that we made a whole bunch of impossible things happen at very short notice without without a whole due process etc first thing the second is just really the importance of integrated metrics and data to drive learning. So um, we see this, we've got, we've got some um, work going on in, in South Africa and Cameroon at the moment where we are working with human settlements and in looking at actually integrating health into, into, into that. And that's the point, David, that you made. One of the key, it's, it's not about convincing people that planetary health is important. Everybody knows health is important. Everybody feels that. But if you look at the metrics of how performance is measured, it doesn't bring it in. So on a day-to-day -day resource limited setting, um, lots to do, it's never going to, it's never going to surface. So we actually running a couple of demonstration projects looking at bringing the health indicators and the human settlement indicators together to say, can we actually use the burden of disease to drive the kinds of health of environmental upgrades that would need to be happened to prioritize based on that as opposed to everyone just doing their own thing. I think we need a lot more of that learning and sharing between, between others. Third point, youth to drive demand. I think there is a supply end, but the demand side of things, as you said, the, the voters of tomorrow, um, the median age in Sub-Saharan Africa is 19. Why, why is there not an uprising on, on, on planetary health today? Because these are so relevant for them. We need to think very practically about how to engage engage um engage those and and an anecdote from that i was giving talking about planetary health in the african context um, um in, at, a, at a meeting in addis and somebody said you know i'm i'm an old man i have diabetes i have high blood pressure you're talking about these long-term things that's all well and good but i don't even have access to medicines today and i said that's why i want to speak to your daughter because you have prioritized need now and i can understand that but I want to make sure that your daughter isn't here in 30 years saying, I can't think about tomorrow because I have problems today. So we have to do these things in parallel. And the last point is redefining what a, what a health professional is. I would move beyond thinking about health. I would move thinking beyond life sciences. Architects are planetary health professionals. Urban planners are planetary health professionals. Farmers are planetary health professionals. I think we need to stop siloing health 
or life sciences as a separate thing because everybody needs to we need to have a kind of a core module where you think about well what i do and actually how i'm being trained what how does those impact on people and planet and actually drive a new kind of curriculum way of thinking around that absolutely vital thanks tolu and i remember someone told me that the health of people and now i'm adding the health of the planet are so important to be left to doctors alone <laughs> And, and uh, you know, every health, you know, Professor Michael Marmot, of course, the, the um, you know, leading advocate for the social determinants of health approach would always remind us that every sector is a health sector. It's not just the, the Ministry of Health. So a lot of really important points uh, that we're getting. Um, and then, um, so we have only a few more minutes. And um, I guess, you know, I'll just ask you for a, you know, round of brief final interventions. Uh, I'm sorry to our other uh, participants uh, who raised a lot of really important questions. We'll try to answer them maybe uh, via email or Twitter. Feel free to reach out to some of our, to our panelists, our esteemed panelists. Um, but there are some uh, questions about, you know, uh, we, we have not yet tackled really uh, the, the role of power and power asymmetries, for example, uh, in, in perpetuating planetary health problems and, and challenges and, and including you know, the corporate capture uh, of, uh, of the soil, of, of our food, uh, of the air, of water, of our health. Uh, and so it's something that uh, we can also um, you know, uh, touch upon uh, in our final round of remarks. Another point is when it comes to, um, you know, uh, this, this fear of, of the unknown, you know, uh, people may be hesitating uh, to, to break the barriers and to leap towards new ways of thinking. But Tolu also reminded us that, you know, the best way to, uh, to predict the future is not through mathematical models, but by creating it. And what, so creating a, a new alternative blueprint uh, for the future. And then there's also one concern about, you know, it seems the world is split into two. There are people right now who are so eager and excited to end this pandemic in order to return to the old normal, uh, which is abnormal to begin with. But also there's some of us, and I hope our, our tribe is increasing and expanding, who are really uh, reminding us, reminding the planet, the, com the, glo the global community, that this is the moment, uh, this is the critical juncture to start thinking about previously unthinkable reforms, you know, and, you know, for example, work from home now is the norm. We've never imagined that becoming a norm uh, a few months back. And so, you know, that, that split, you know, how can we convince the, you know, people from the other side of the fence and really join uh, us in this uh, road towards uh, planetary health transformation. So, so I'll ask you for a quick round, maybe a sentence or two, just to inspire or to stimulate the brains of our uh, very uh, energetic audience. And then I will uh, invite um, our friend, uh, uh, Marjorie Nikod from the UHC 2030 uh, to give some closing remarks. So who would like to start um, this this final round and for sure this is not the final conversation this is just the beginning anyone or we'll go alphabetical in alphabetical order David first <laughs> no I was not going to be the man going first <laughs> but since you, since my name comes first I guess I will no this has been very inspiring I think um, from so on the Earth Commission, we're really trying to think about this top-down approach of understanding a safe and just planet, so safe biophysically and just socioeconomically. Um, but I think the discussion we've had here and focusing on health, which I, I normally don't do, really emphasizes the importance of these local narratives, the narratives brought from the ground up to that, that really build a collective action that we need to move forward. So that's, that's my final thought. Thank you, David. After letter D, I think it's J, Jamila, Jamila Mahmoud. <laughs> yeah, I think that, you know, we've got to keep pushing the message out. And I think we've got to remain connected and 
continually, you know, energize the, the dialogue around planetary health. I think what we need to also do is very quickly look at nomenclature, right? What are other, what are other people using to describe what we are calling planetary health? And then, you know, trying to find alignment in, with those groups as well. But I would say stick to what we have uh, already existing, build on that. And then, you know, widen this concept and, and show people understand what planetary health is. Thank you. And then now it's Nicole's turn. Thanks. Uh, so just two pieces uh, that I want to put out there for thought provocation. And uh, we have a, a, a principle that we, we have in many of our Indigenous traditions called the seventh generation principle. And if we think about reporting a G GDP monthly, quarterly, you know, for our seventh generation principle, it means that we always have to think about seven generations in the future. So any decision that we make um, has to be in context with those seven generations. And I think um, that embodiment of that principle inbound within the laws of many Indigenous societies, at least here on Turtle Island in North America, um, you know, is sort of a true reflection of that planetary health mindset uh, going forward. And then the second piece is, is that I also think because we're talking about health governance and, and medicine, is not forgetting about our traditional medicine practices around the world because they are one of the most sustainable practices that uh, completely also embody those planetary health directives within the, the practice uh, based on a premise of prevention. And you know we have a very authoritative state sometimes in medicine when it comes to differentiation between sort of what is conventional and ev evidence-based comparatively to what is traditional, historical, and evidence-informed, uh, which is you know how our Indigenous medicine systems have existed for thousands of years and why we are today. Um, so, you know, I think we need to also remember about some of those other dialogues that happen and how our medicine systems got formed as a human society, which was not based on the principles that we premise our, our governance and medicine systems today. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to speak today and, and very um, enlightening to hear all of the other speakers and uh, happy to entertain any questions later on in any other platforms. Thank you so much, Nicole. And then last but not the least, Toldu. Thanks. Um, I don't have really very much else to say. I think it's broken a lot. I would perhaps say two things. Firstly, emergency health foresight. So we need to start redefining emergency to catalyze action. We can see that when something is framed as an emergency, there is a potential to really break through what is, what is knowable. Um, and so how do we frame, thinking about how we frame planetary health, not just as an emergency in general, but actually in the ways that we operationalize that, that emergency response has to be, um, in, it should be integrated. I think we can learn from the emergency response in that way. And the last thing I would say is, in case anyone on the call here is wondering, you are a planetary health professional. Thank you so much, Tolu. And yeah, um, wow. It's, you know, we, we just opened a treasure chest of planetary health wisdom. And I think after this webinar, our next, next task is to evangelize the word. Sorry for, I'm using, for using the word evangelize, but we need to really disseminate uh, this, this wealth of, of information and insights in order to really uh, steer our future towards uh, planetary health, healthy people, and healthy planet. Now I would like to invite our friend from UHC 2030, Marjolyn Nikod, for some closing remarks. Marjolyn, please. Hi, everyone. Um, after all uh, this uh, great discussion and uh, eloquent conclusions made by its speakers themselves, I mean, it's hard for me to, to bring a lot more, but I would take up the call for evangelization um, because I think uh, this is this is critical and uh, UAT 2030 actually provides the, the space uh, for that and I think it's great that um, the, the health systems governance collaborative is part of the UAC health systems family uh, so is part of UAT 2030 and we can work together uh, in, in this reset. Um, and basically, um, 
I would suggest that there are two uh, maybe ways where uh, we can, at least from the, the UHC 2030 uh, secretariat and some of the critical constituencies can, can, you know, can start with. And first is the um, discussion and consensus around health systems and what they are and what they should be. And obviously COVID has shown that uh, obviously the, the dimension of, uh, of, um, of uh, health promotion and, uh, um, and uh, the, the full spe spectrum of, of health promotion, prevention and, and treatment was not really actually integrated in the health systems uh, discourse. So we, we have basically uh, already issued a discussion paper and I will share the link where we are looking at what do we need to, you know, to think differently about health systems and how do we uh, try to take uh, this uh, in, in a different way to, to bring the uh, health emergency uh, response integrated in the, the health systems. And I think this resonates a lot with what has been discussed here. And I'm sure we could enrich the, the, the discussion with some nuances in terms of bringing the, uh, you know, the traditional medicines, the perspectives of people, in, you know, going back to the lessons uh, and then the wisdom of uh, indigenous uh, communities, for example. And secondly, I think, um, and this is something that UHC has been established for, to create a, a movement for universal health coverage. And um, it's, it's about really making sure that everyone's power count. And we've talked a lot about power. And, um, and basically, I would also uh, take up the, the challenge, going back to this uh, evangelization uh, concept, but, you know, raising awareness, but more than that, creating really a kind of alliance or, or, or strong people-led uh, movement uh, behind, uh, you know, um, uh, this notion of, uh, of uh, preparedness and emergency response and, and make sure that we, we don't have uh, another uh, crisis like this one, or if there is one, we are better prepared and can, can, you know, can, uh, can um, respond in, in, in better ways. Um, so uh, I think we, we have already the, the basis for, you know, um, uh, creating this reset and I think we need now to join hands across uh, the uh, people uh, in the governance community with civil society community groups to really change also the, the advocacy uh, content I mean you know it should no longer be just like more for health but what you know would be better for for health as a whole and I like also some of these messages that health should be everyone's business and we need to take this movement beyond the people uh, you know working in health and I think it's time now to 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 reach out to everyone that cares and obviously COVID uh, was a kind of uh, wake-up call that obviously nobody can ignore uh, health and their right to health and everyone should be part of this movement. So uh, I hope that there will be some future conversation where we can discuss practically uh, how to uh, build up this awareness raising, messaging and, and, and take it forward in a way where we can really um, make power count and influence uh, you know, decision-making processes. Thank you very much, Marjolyn. And it's great to hear that uh, there are uh, discussions currently uh, go, uh, ongoing uh, when it comes to redefining and rethinking the health system. And actually, I'm seeing a lot of comments in the chat box saying that the health system should include nature, should include communities, should include uh, uh, you know, society. And, and you know, it's, it's really a... a a, a challenge to the conventional health systems thinking, you know, the building blocks, as we fondly call the different components of health care uh, and not health systems uh, writ large. I just want to, um, you know, share with you uh, before we close that uh, the Planetary Health Alliance has just launched a new textbook. Uh, and you can see now uh, on your screens this book. Uh, there's even a discount code at the bottom. So, you know, do a screenshot, save those details, and you can order this uh, pioneering textbook. Um, again, talking about these issues um, that confront the health of people and the health of the planet. And also, just last week, the Planetary Health Alliance launched 
a new anthology of solutions. I remember Jamila was referring to finding those case studies of innovative solutions that tackle issues at the nexus of human and env the environment's health. And, and this definitely is um, uh, that place, uh, the place to begin with when it comes to finding those solutions, okay? So that's it. We just ended our second webinar that, uh, uh, that is part of this uh, exciting series about building the reset uh, in preparation for a much better, much healthier, more sustainable future. And um, I remember uh, this quote from Arundhati Roy, who is an Indian novelist. She just published an article a few, a few months back and she described this pandemic. You know, there's so many metaphors already used to describe the pandemic. A lot of war metaphors, you know, ju ju it's it just, in, in, just indicative of global health's obsession with empire and invasion. And, and I think now is the time to go back to a lot of the ideas that Nicole has uh, uh, shared with us today. And Arundhati Roy described this pandemic as a portal, as a portal from the old world to the new world. And I think in this journey, we need a new compass and hopefully that new compass is planetary health, this positive vision for the health of both people and planet, not just one over the other. And we just heard from this webinar, all these issues and all the opportunities that are within reach um, in order to make sure the, the vision of planetary health uh, uh, gets realized. Uh, in this day and age of COVID and, and beyond. So I look forward to more conversations with all of you. Thank you to our very um, collaborative and active audience. Thanks to our fantastic panel and the organizers behind this uh, uh, webinar series, Marjolyn Godely Van Hetteren. Thanks for your leadership, Benjamin Rupi, and all our friends from WHO, UHE 2030, Health Systems Governance Collaborative, and all the other networks that are part of this uh, campaign. Again, thank you. Good day, good afternoon, good morning, good night, and stay safe. Bye-bye. <laughs>